Okay, welcome again. I'm Robert Breaker, and every week I come to you with a new sermon in English and in Spanish. And uh, last week we looked at a, a question that some people had brought up that I have dealt with most of my ministry. Matter of fact, while I was in Bible school, I was taught in Bible school about this, and I was warned. When you get out there as a minister, you'll find there's a lot of people that don't understand the Bible, that don't rightly divide. And so they say things that just aren't biblical. They'll say things that may sound good, but when you look at the Bible itself, those things just aren't true. They, what they've done is they've made up a man, a man saying or, or a saying of a denomination or a traditional saying that they made up, and then they teach that saying as though it was doctrine. But it's not. And some people said, well, Brother Breaker, I understood your message last time, but I didn't understand why you presented it. And last time, what I preached on was salvation in the Old Testament by works. And we looked at this question of how were they saved in the Old Testament. And I showed you clearly that in the Old Testament, people were saved by an element of works that they had to do. There were some works involved in the Old Testament when it came to your salvation. And what I did is I showed that they're not saved in the Old Testament the same as we are in the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, when you died, you didn't even go to heaven. You went to Abraham's bosom. So I won't re-preach that message. But uh, several questions that I had in, in, in my emails were, Brother Breaker, could you explain a little bit more about why you dealt with that subject? Okay, sure. And then what I'm going to do today is I'm going to deal with this subject, which I think is pretty cool. This is the subject of... Okay, hold on. Armageddon. This is the subject of how do people get saved in the tribulation period? What if someone were to miss the rapture, Brother Breaker? How would they get saved? Well, that's what we're going to deal with today. Now, I'm preaching on this subject because, like I said last time, there were some people that attacked me. Now, I'm not interested in these people that attacked me, nor am I interested in attacking back. But I did say in last week's video that I appreciate them. I appreciate their attack, uh, attacks because they bring up the topic. They bring up the controversy. They bring up the discussion. And what these people that have attacked me have said is they say that I'm wrong because I teach salvation is different in different parts of the Bible. And they say, and this is the man-made, uh, made-up a little saying that I, I showed you last week, is that they say, people are saved the same in the entire Bible. Or they say, people are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament. Or they say things like, people are saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross, and people are saved in the New Testament by looking back to the cross. Is this biblical? Is this scriptural? Is that statement doctrinally sound? Or is that something that they heard someone else say, and they thought that was right? So I showed you last week that that saying is not correct. In the Old Testament, under the law, there were some works involved for salvation. And I showed you many verses on that. It cannot be denied that in the Old Testament, you had to do something. You had to keep the commandments. You had to do these things. Now, these people that attack, and like I said, they're, they're nothing new. I was taught in Bible school there's people like that. Uh, as I got out as a minister and preached, I met people like that. And now as I preach on YouTube, there's still people like that. And, and like I said last time, what they're doing is they're showing their ignorance. Because have they actually studied the Bible, they wouldn't say such a silly thing. There are differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, when you died, you didn't even go to heaven. You went to Abraham's bosom. I'll just abbreviate that. And now, if you're lost you go to hell. If you're saved, you go to heaven. So that's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Not the same. In the New Testament, when we're saved, we're saved by trusting the blood of Jesus Christ. That's His blood. That's Jesus' blood. Not the same blood as under the law. Under the law, when a man sinned, he had to have animal blood. So not the same blood. So there's so many differences. Uh, for example, when we're saved in the New Testament, why the Bible teaches that today we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Nobody was sealed with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Now they got it, and it left, and it came back, and it left. Some people never got it. Most of the people that kept the law never got the Holy Spirit. So there are so many differences in the Old Testament and the New Testament that it is impossible to, to say with a straight face 
that people are saved the same throughout the entire Bible. That statement is not correct. Now, I understand these people that say that. They want to say, but it's always been by grace. And I agree. Yes, but under the law, God said, thou shalt not do this, 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 that, or the other thing. And if you do, you'll be cut off and you'll go to hell. But the grace was, unless you bring an animal sacrifice. So yes, under the law, there was grace. But the works were involved even in the grace because you had to be the one bringing the animal. You had to put the leash on the animal and drag it to the temple. You had to cut the throat. And then the priest caught the blood and offered it up. So even in that, there are works. So you just can't say everyone's always saved by faith and grace in the whole Bible. Yes, there was faith in the Old Testament. But faith in what? Faith in the blood, but a different blood. So I don't understand why people will say, people are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament. I'm a Bible believer. I read the scriptures. I don't see that. And I'm not afraid to say that I don't see it. I'm not afraid to stand up against people that teach that. Because what it does is it proves that I believe the Bible, and I'm giving you what the Bible says, and that's what it's all about. What does God say about it? Not man. Amen. But also, by presenting this, we're dealing with the issue. We're not dealing with the person or the people that want to attack. We're dealing with the actual doctrine to see, hey, some people say this. Are they right or are they wrong? What does the Bible say? And so it's not about Robert Breaker being right or wrong. It's, is the Scripture correct? And what does God say about it in the Bible? Well, when we look at the Bible, we see salvation is different in different time periods. And in the Old Testament, there was an element of works involved. And you had to do these works to be saved. In the New Testament, in the church age in which we live today, it's not of works. Today, we're saved by grace through faith, without works. I'm going to misspell through on purpose. Grace through faith without works. So there are no works that save us today. It's whether or not we believe in the finished work of Christ. And that's wonderful. It's great to talk about these things because it, it, when a person is saved, it makes them so grateful and so thankful that they're saved not by works but by faith. And we look back at how it was in the Old Testament and we say, man, we truly are blessed today. We truly are blessed. Now Now that we are saved, though, we want to do good works. We're not doing the works to get to heaven and say, oh, I hope God accepts me because I do good works. No, we're saved by faith without works, and now what do we do? Because we love God so much for saving us, now we want to serve Him. We want to do works for Him. And the works don't save us or keep us safe. They're just a way for us to show God how much we love Him. The Old Testament was there, there was very little love. <laughs> And the Old Testament was all, oh, i got to do this again. And there wasn't, I love God. It was boring. Well, the New Testament, thank God I'm saved. Now I can serve Jesus Christ. Let's start today our teaching, because the teaching today is going to be on the subject of how do you get saved in the tribulation? Many of these people that say that anti-biblical statement of people are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament, many of them, when you say, well, how do you get saved in the tribulation, they say, well, the same way you get saved today. <laughs> how funny. How funny a statement. Again, a person that answers in such a way, I have to look at and I have to question, sir, have you ever even read the Bible? The Bible is very clear how people get saved in the tribulation, and it's not the same way that we get saved today. We do not get saved in the tribulation. I say we. I'm not going to be there, so let me rephrase that. You do not get saved in the tribulation by simply trusting in Jesus as your Savior. Again, there's an element of works, and I've always believed, and I was taught this in Bible school, but like I say, I don't believe it because they taught me in Bible school. I believe it because I found it in the Scriptures for myself, and I said, yeah, yeah, that's right. Then in the tribulation period, salvation is by faith and works. So faith plus works in the tribulation. So there is an element of works involved in the tribulation period that you have to do if you miss the rapture. So really the greatest time in all of history to live is right now. When salvation is by faith alone in the finished work of Christ, we trust what He's done is through God's faith and uh, God's grace and our faith in His finished work. What a great time to live, and yet people just don't care. Most of the world today just says, I don't want to be saved. How sad, how sad. But what a great time in which we live. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 
And I want to read verse 14, 15, and 16. And boy, this, has, this makes so much sense in light of what we talked about last week and what we're going to look at this week. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm sure you know verse 15, but I want to read the context, verse 14 and, and 16 as well. So starting in verse 14 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, we read, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. We should never have an argument. We should never debate, as the Bible says, about words to no profit. What on earth does it profit anyone to use that saying, people are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament, when the Bible clearly teaches differently? Why would you, why would you strive to defend that statement that's not a biblical statement? I have showed you last week that there is a difference. So verse 15 is the command. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So don't be ashamed. I tell you, you folks that that say that statement, you ought to be ashamed. You've just told the whole world that you don't read the Bible, and you've never studied it. Because if you study it, you can't help but see there's dispensations in the Bible, different time periods in which God deals with people in different ways, and it's not always the same. I've got a video on YouTube entitled Dispensations. I've also got another one entitled Misunderstanding Salvation. That's a good YouTube video. I would encourage you to watch that as well. It shows you the mess you get in when you don't rightly divide. The mess that you get in when you don't see dispensations. You don't understand the different ways that God deals with different people in different times. So we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God and not be ashamed. We're supposed to rightly divide the word of truth. Now verse 16 says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Alright, so if someone begins to babble and say things that aren't scriptural, and they go around and they say their little man-made sayings, and it's not doctrinal, it's not biblically doctrinally sound, then what will that do? That will increase unto more ungodliness. And we're to shun that. We're to say, no, I will not follow you in that folly. I will not listen to your vain and profane babblings. I do not accept your statement that people are saved the same in the entire Bible. That's not what the Bible teaches. As I rightly divide, I divide the first basic division in the Bible of Old Testament and New Testament. And I see that in the Old Testament, oh, they're saved by works. The New Testament, we're saved by grace through faith without works. I see a difference. I cannot be like you because if I follow your false teaching, verse 16 says, that will increase unto more ungodliness. That is the way or the path to go against God and sound doctrine. And that will take me even farther and farther and farther down the line of false doctrine. Because you're teaching your traditions of men rather than the Bible. And the Bible says that uh, Jesus even said, he says, they teach as doctrine their traditions. And he says, the tradition of men makes the word of God of none effect. Jesus Christ said, no, don't teach man's traditions. Teach Scripture. Teach the Bible. And so that's what I want to be faithful doing, teaching what the Bible says, not what some man said, not what some denomination says, not what some Bible school teacher says. I want to teach what the Bible says, not what some man wrote in a commentary years ago. I want to teach the Scriptures. And I believe that I did that last week, showing you about how salvation was under the law. But this question comes up, and I've heard it from many people today. Well, Brother Breaker, how were they saved in the tribulation? It's different than how they're saved today. And these people that believe in this statement of oh, they're always saved the same in the Old Testament as the New, they say, no, you're saved the same way in the tribulation. Well, that's very hard to believe. Even someone who's not saved, who's looking at Christianity, could look through and see that that statement doesn't make sense. Because something changes right before the tribulation, and that something is the rapture of the church. And the church is taken out. And when the church is taken out, you know what's taken out with it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leaves this world at the rapture. So there's no people getting sealed with the Holy Spirit in the tribulation unless possibly it may be Jewish believers. But it's not Gentiles, like today. Many people that are saved today are Gentiles. They get sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul says, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, and you let him be accursed. Paul's Gospels, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. He preaches that. But in the book of Revelation, in the tribulation period, there's an angel preaching another gospel. Well, if it was the same dispensation, then it'd be a cursed angel. 
But it's not, because there was a change that took place. So God has always dealt with different people in different ways, and there's always been this big change that takes place first before he, can, he begins to deal with people in another way. The big change with Moses was he got them out of slavery, out of Egypt, delivered them miraculously, destroyed the entire Egypt, Egyptian army, and that was the change. And the change was now God says, I'm going to deal with you through the Old Testament of Moses. Jesus shows up, shows miracles, and he dies on the cross for the sins of everyone. And he says, now guess what? Paul, come here. This is the way it's going to be. So there's changes in the Bible. There's right divisions. There's things that take place that, that make things different. And then after those huge things take place, then something is different than the way it was before. Well, the rapture is going to be huge. So many people that are saved are going to leave. And then there's going to be another way that God deals with men. So I want you to see that. I want you to see that. It's not right to make this statement. People are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament. That's not true. People say people are saved the same in the entire Bible. Not so. I'm sorry. You have not studied the Bible. That's not what the Bible teaches. People say people are saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross, and the Old Testament by looking back to the cross. And boy, that just sounds so beautiful, but no, no. No one in the Old Testament way back would have known what a cross was. The cross was a Roman thing. What do you do with Abraham? What do you do with Adam and Eve? What do you do with Noah? Do you think they were going, boy, I just can't wait till Jesus dies on the cross? <laughs> no, because the name of Jesus wasn't revealed until right before Jesus was born. And the angel says, thou shalt call his name Jesus. All the people knew in the Old Testament was, there's a promise in Genesis chapter 3 of a seed coming someday to redeem us. So we're hoping for that. But in the meantime, God told us to do this, this, and this, and that's what we're going to do. So there is a difference between Old Testament and New Testament salvation. So how are people saved in the tribulation? That's what we're going to look at today. How do people get saved? And is there an element of works involved in that tribulation? Now, let me just say this quickly. This makes people so angry. <laughs> so many men that I've met, as I've said before, I've preached in over 200 churches. And uh, I have people tell me, I just can't believe you preached in that many churches and you're only a 43-year-old man. I just don't believe it. Well, I was on deputation for three years. Let's see, there's 52 uh, weeks in a year. I preached in one church Sunday morning, another church Sunday night. So you do the math. And then I preached in many churches on a Wednesday night and even some churches on a Thursday night. So you do the math. And you multiply all that together, and I, I didn't have a solid calendar where I was every single, but most of my calendar was full. I preached in over 200 churches in my lifetime. And I preached in these churches, and many of the times I'd go to a church, I'd run into a pastor, and the pastor went to a Bible school that taught him people are saved the same way in the entire Bible. And I'd say, Pastor, that, that just sounds so beautiful, but have you ever thought about this and that? And, this? and I'd show him Bible verses. And like I said, every time they said, well, I never thought about that. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, the Old Testament was different than the New Testament. Yeah, yeah, uh, God told Noah to build a boat. That's not our instruction for us today. There are different times. So it is biblical, it is scriptural, and the, the job of a New Testament minister is to teach and to preach and to help people see what the Bible says. And that's what I'm trying to do is take you to the scripture. So... We're going to look at today the tribulation period and how people are saved in the tribulation period. But before we do, I want to answer the question of what is the tribulation. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 30. Again, people might ask, why are you preaching this? Because this is something I get a lot of emails about. A lot of people ask me in e emails about this question of, of whether or not people are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New. Because that's what they hear in the pulpits on Sundays in a lot of their churches. And they just scratch their head and say, wow, I didn't realize that my pastor was so shallow. <laughs> that he's just teaching a statement that he heard some man say. And he doesn't have enough time to study and rightly divide and show how it really is in the Bible. And so that's what I want to do. I want to show you the whole deal. I'm not holding anything back. The Apostle Paul says we're to preach the whole counsel of God, which means we tell you everything that the Bible says, and we show it to you in detail. We don't just say, oh, it's all the same. Don't even read it. Don't. No, we study. We rightly divide. So Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 3 through 11, I want to show you what the tribulation is. It's called in the Bible the time of Jacob's trouble. So Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I give to their fathers, and they shall possess it. 
Here's an Old Testament prophecy that God says, I will give Israel and Judah their land back. And you know what happened in 1947? The United Nations voted to allow the Jews to have their land back. In 1948, they founded their own government, and they became the nation of Israel again. Verse 4, And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. 5, For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Uh-oh. Verse 6, Ask ye now, and, ye, and see whether a man doth travail with child, with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned unto paleness. Now, quite quite interesting verse. How does a man travail with child? But it mentions a woman giving birth, a woman in travail. Well, that's interesting because Paul speaks about the time of the rapture comes and, and, and the tribulation and everything. It's all about a woman in travail and them saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Well, this almost sounds like something Paul said in the New Testament. And uh, I preached on, you know, the Revelation 12 sign in September 23rd, 2017. And boy, is that, is that what it's talking about here? <laughs> Something like that? It, it sounds like it, a woman in travail. I believe that sign has to do with Israel and the coming of the tribulation very, very shortly. And the rapture soon, and I believe the rapture is going to be very soon. But anyway, it says here in verse 7, Alas, for that day is great. What is that day that he's talking about? So that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. What is the time of Jacob's trouble? Well, the context here is all about the tribulation period. Let's continue reading down to verse 11 so you can see the context. 8. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. Now verse 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measures, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So what we have here is a prophecy which God is telling Israel in the last days he will bring them back to their land. Well, that happened in the 47, 48. And he says that he will gather all nations together and destroy them, and then he'll rule over them. Well, Armageddon is when Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation and destroys the enemies of Israel, destroys the nation, and Jesus sets up for a thousand years his millennial kingdom. So, obviously, the context here is this time period of the tribulation, and it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And it says that God says he will punish them. Now, why would God punish Israel? Because they turned against God. Uh, a lot of people today, they, they say, I just don't understand how God could punish the people of Israel. Have you ever been to Israel? I haven't, but I study it, and I, I feel like I've been there. I've seen so many uh, uh, documentaries, and, and i looked up so many different places in Israel, and it's a small country, so it's easy to see where everything is. But Israel is one of the, the most sinful nations in the world today. I hate to say it, but it's true. The biggest homosexual population in the entire world is Tel Aviv, Israel. So there's a lot of sin going on in Israel, according to the Bible. And so God has to punish Israel for their sin before he can come back and reign. So the time of Jacob's trouble is just that. It's the time for Jacob. Who is Jacob? Israel. So Israel is going to be punished, and then when they come through the punishment, then they come out and God says, now you're my people, now you're, you're clean, you're purified, now you're going to be ruled over by me for a thousand years. So Jacob's trouble is the tribulation period. Now why did I go into such detail to tell you that? Because there are people today that say, well, we believe that the church is going to go through the tribulation. Why? Why? Why would the church go through the tribulation period when it doesn't say in the Bible it's the time of the church's trouble, it says it's the time of Jacob's trouble? Why would the church even be there if it's for God to deal with Israel? Secondly, the body of Christ is called the bride of Christ, the church. The church is Jesus Christ's bride. Why would Jesus Christ give his bride to the Antichrist? Because during this tribulation period, the Antichrist rules. What kind of man comes to marry his wife but says, you know what, before we get married, I'm going to let you have another man first. <laughs> I'm going to let another man rule over you and then I'll come get you. No, no. A man wants 
his wife to be chaste and a virgin, not shacking up with someone else. So I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I've got many videos on YouTube about that. Now, I don't have time to read it, but Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 8 is another verse in the Bible. That's Zephaniah, not Zechariah. Zephaniah 3, 8. And God says his desire is to gather the nations so that he may destroy them. So God is going to gather all the nations together and destroy them at the Battle of Armageddon. So goodbye, United Nations. Goodbye, UN, the most corrupt governing body in the history of the world. Someday they will be destroyed by Jesus Christ. So the tribulation period is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time for Israel. Now I want you to go to Daniel chapter 9. I believe, and I will say it, and I am not ashamed to say it, uh, some people today are, but I am not ashamed to tell you that I believe in a seven-year tribulation. I believe that the, seven, that the tribulation period is made up of seven years total. So I believe in a seven-year tribulation. So I'm going to call the tribulation a seven-year period. Now, why do I say that? Because that's what the church has believed for, oh, hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, because if you look at Paul, that's what he believes. And you can even go to a, I won't even go there, I was going to mention the epistle of Barnabas, but like I say, I don't ever run to uh, other books that aren't the 66 books of the King James Bible. But you look at this, at the seven year period of the tribulation. Now you might say, well, where do you get this seven years of the future tribulation? Well, Daniel chapter 9 talks about this, and Daniel chapter 9 says, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And it goes on there, and in, in verse 25 it says, Seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Okay, you add seven to three score and two, that's 69. Now, I don't know why the Bible divides it up that way. Um, there's sure probably a lot more in this passage that we don't understand that we'll understand by and by. Amen? But this was a prophecy given in Daniel to the people of Israel. And it says there, 62 weeks plus two weeks, verse, uh, uh, plus seven weeks, verse 25, that makes 69 weeks. And then in verse 27, it talks about something taking place in the midst of a week. And then this and that and that takes place. So you have God giving 69 weeks given to Israel. But that last week is missing. So God tells Israel in the beginning of that, that passage is that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, O Israel. Well, Daniel would have written uh, somewhere over in this area. And Daniel said, you've got 70 weeks. Now it's a week of years in the Bible. So that's what, 483 years? And if you study what he's saying is going to happen, that's when Jesus showed up and everything. So most Bible scholars agree that the 69 weeks are done. So there's one week, a one week period, a week of years, that's still future. And that one week period is seven years. And what the Bible does is it divides that seven year period into three and a half years and three and a half years. Because three and a half plus three and a half is seven. I'm going to take you through and show you some verses. This is what most Christians have believed for many, many centuries until just the last couple of years. And now, in the last couple of years, a lot of people are saying, well, we don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. We believe in a mid-tribulation rapture. And so many people lately are saying, we believe the church goes halfway through the tribulation. Now, why? Why would the church go into a time that's called Jacob's trouble? If the church was there too, then it's got to be Jacob and the church's trouble. No, that's not what the Bible calls it. And you go to Paul, you find out that Paul says that blindness in part has happened to Israel and that after the rapture takes place, well, then God goes back to dealing with Israel. So it all makes sense that this is a tribulation in its future, and it's all for Israel. And in the last part of, of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, she shall make it desolate even until the consummation of that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, now I wanted to read verse 26 also. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll read the end where it talks about, And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now I think that's interesting. A, a flood is mentioned with the end. Now we're going to go over to the book of Revelation here in a minute, chapter 12, and it mentions the flood. So, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation tie together. And yet Daniel was, met, was written, what, so many hundreds of years, probably close to 600 years before the book of Revelation? Only God could do that. Obviously, God is the author. So, the tribulation period, 
I believe, is a seven-year period. Now, some people say, no, it's three and a half years. Well, I guess we'll just find out, won't we? <laughs> when we get to heaven, I'll be happy to say I was wrong if it's only three and a half years. Some people say the first three and a half years of the tribulation took place during Jesus' ministry. And so it's halfway over, so there's only three and a half left. Well, if that's the case, then guess what? The church is in the tribulation right now. <laughs> The 2,000 years of the church age is slap dab in the middle of the tribulation. So I guess the church went through the tribulation. I don't, I don't, I don't see that. I, that. That just doesn't make much sense to me. But a lot of people say it does to them and that's what they teach. Well, let me show you why. Here's two verses in the book of Revelation that make me think a future seven years. Let me show you what they say. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Revelation 11, 1 says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Okay, this is still future, and this is in the tribulation period, and it says there's somebody worshiping in an altar. Who would that be? The Jews. Now, verse 2, And the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So here the book of Revelation says... By the way, 42 months is exactly three and a half years. So the Bible says here that somebody is worshiping in the first three and a half years. Who would be worshiping? Well, that would be the Jews worshiping in their temple. That's why many Christians have said for many different years that the temple has to be rebuilt in Israel. And they say that the Jews worship three and a half years in that temple, and then the Gentiles come and the Gentiles get it for 42 months. Well, 42 months would be the last half of the tribulation. So that's one verse there that, to me, appears to show after the rapture, the Jews worship in the temple, probably for three and a half years, it doesn't say. But one thing we know is that when they're kicked out, the Gentiles get it for the three and a half years. So the last three and a half years belong to the Gentiles. So that, to me, looks like seven years future. Another verse, Revelation chapter 13. This is why I still believe in a seven-year... And boy, if I studied, I've studied a lot of books, and I've read a lot, and I still cling to seven-year future tribulation. Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. And they worshipped the red dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? Now look at verse 5. And there was given unto him, who? The beast. A mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to... Now watch this very next word. This word is taken out of all other versions of the Bible. That's why I can't stress to you enough the importance of a King James Bible. Because only the King James Bible has this word. And if you take this word out, you mess up the entire tribulation, and you get people a false hope. It says here, And power was given unto him to continue for forty-two months. Continue means you keep going. So it's talking about the beast. And it says the beast continues 42 months. Well, if the beast continues for 42 months, then what is that inferring? That he must have been, for 42 months, already ruling. So I see these two verses as confirmation that there's a seven-year tribulation. It's future. In the first three and a half years, the Jews are worshiping in their temple. Something happens in the middle of that tribulation seven year period and then the Gentiles come and stay in the temple for 42 months and the beast continues ruling for 42 months and in the passage I don't have time to read that's when the Antichrist comes in and sits down in the throne and says that he is God and yet he's not now let's go to 2nd Thessalonians I want to give you as much background information as I can and then I'm going to show you what the Bible teaches about how a person is saved in the tribulation and you know what it's going to do? It's going to show you that they're not saved the same as today. It's different in the tribulation. That's why I want you to be saved today. Because it's way easier to be saved today than in the tribulation period. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our, by our, by our gathering together unto Him, why we're gathered together unto Him at the rapture, that you be that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first. Now watch what it says. And that man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of perdition. Now, a lot of people will read this passage and pretend like that comma isn't even there. But that comma is so important in the King James Bible because it gives us two different names of the Antichrist. 
The Bible calls him the man of sin and comma, the son of perdition. He has two names. Now, I was in uh, uh, high school, and when I was in high school, I took typing class, and I, I got out of that as soon as I could. I was in that probably a couple weeks, and I went to my counselor. I said, I'm not taking this class. That, that teacher is wicked, and she wants to fail people. And I didn't go to high school to fail. I came here to get good grades. I said, what is another option? Because that woman, she literally had a, a ruler. She'd go around and hit people in the hand that weren't typing fast enough. I said, I won't sit under that. And they said, well, we have a journalism class. I said, why didn't I know that? I would have taken journalism over typing any day. And so I, I um, changed classes in the middle of high school from that awful teacher uh, of typing, and I went to journalism class. And one of the things we, we learned in journalism is that if you're reading a newspaper, usually on the title, they don't have room to write the word and. <laughs> Even though it's three little letters. You have a title, you want to make it as big as possible. So oftentimes, and would have a comma. And they always taught us in journalism class that a, a comma can mean and, especially in journalism. So look at what it's saying here. It's saying, and that the man of sin be revealed and the son of perdition. What is this? The man of sin is the son of perdition. He's the same guy. And he has two different names. And so what it looks like to me, it says that the man of sin be revealed. Well, the man of sin would be the Antichrist or the beast, and the man of sin would be the guy that is, is sitting there for the first three and a half years. And then something happens in the middle of that three and a half years. And then the son of perdition is in charge. Now, who is the son of perdition? Oh, oh, oh man, I might have bit off more than I can chew in this sermon. I don't have time to go there. I do believe I have a YouTube video about who is the son of perdition. But in Jesus' time, Judas is called the son of perdition. And the Bible says that the devil entered into him. Well, as we read the book of Revelation, we find out that this person who's called the beast, the man who's the Antichrist, he receives a deadly wound. And then his deadly wound is healed. So it, it appears that the Antichrist, three and a half years into the tribulation, is killed. And that Satan literally enters into him and resurrects. And Satan, in a human body of a man, rules for three and a half years, continues for 42 months. That's what I see when I be, read the book of Revelation. If you don't, fine, whatever. But that's what I see here as well. And uh, this isn't just me. There's other men that believe that. There's a lot of, if you get Clarence Larkin's dispensational truth, that's what he taught as well. And I see that here. And so it says the rapture can't come except there being a falling away first. Well, the falling away is the apostasy. Right here before the rapture, so many people have fallen away from doctrinal teachings. So we see that. We see a falling away in our day. And then it says, then the man of sin must be revealed. Well, guess what? When is the man of sin revealed? As the, as the Antichrist. Right here. Exactly the time that the rapture takes place. So I have taught, and other people teach, that as soon as the Antichrist is revealed to the world, as soon as he comes on the scene, that's when the rapture takes place. That sets off the beginning of the counting of the seven-year period. You know what that means? That means the church is going to see who the Antichrist is. Now, is it this last guy we had president in America? A lot of people's thought is, and I kind of think it's possible, is that uh, he will become the head of the United Nations. And I can just imagine watching the news and watching Fox News. Bra -bra -bra, this just in, so-and-so is voted in as the head of the United Nations. And as soon as that is announced, I can just, I can just, I can see it. Look at my wife going, woohoo! And then, boop, 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 a trumpet, and we're out of here. <laughs> That's what it seems like it's going to be like. As soon as he's revealed, the rapture is going to take place. Now, when Obama was elected president, many people thought he would be the Antichrist, and he could still be a future Antichrist. But I remember when he was elected president, I ran outside in the middle of the dark, and I started going, Come on, Jesus, come on! And I said, Well, must not have been the Antichrist. And I went back inside and went to bed. <laughs> because the Bible says that when the Antichrist is revealed, that's when the rapture. So he might, might be future, but he wasn't then. So obviously being revealed as a United States president isn't the revelation. That's why I've always thought he has to be revealed to the whole world as a one world leader. It's got to be the United Nations. Whenever this guy is elected as the head of the United Nations, that's got to be the revelation to the whole world. And then that's probably when. Now I could be wrong, but I'm saying that's what I see that it looks like. So verse 3 says that the falling away first and the man of sin, sin be revealed. So the Antichrist is called the man of sin. He's the one that rules the first three and a half years. And then it says, comma, the son of perdition. Who is the son of perdition? Well, notice that 
in that verse, there's a semicolon after verse 3. That means verse 4 ties in to verse 3. And notice what it says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sinneth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now who is this? Well, all of verse 4 has to go back to the son of perdition, because there was a comma. So it can't apply to the man of sin, it applies to the son of perdition. And the son of perdition, the Bible says, is the one that sits in the temple showing himself he is God. Well, that would be the son of perdition. That would be Satan incarnate. So in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is assassinated, something that many people have believed and taught for, for millennia, centuries. And as soon as that takes place, I think maybe three days later, you see the devil always imitates everything Jesus does, so would he lay in the grave three days and three nights and then... The, the son of perdition, Satan, incarnate, raise again and say, look, I'm alive. It's possible. And then that's when he reigns. Well, that's when the Gentiles get it for 42 months. So when the Gentiles get the Temple Mount for 42 months, well, then that would make sense. That's when the Antichrist goes and sits down and calls himself God and sits himself in the Temple. So I see a future seven-year tribulation without doubt. Now, if you don't see that, that's fine. <laughs> You can believe as you wish, but I, I think it's interesting how so many people contact me and say, Brother Breaker, I used to think no rapture or mid-tribulation rapture, but the more I watch your videos, the more I see you're right. There's a pre-tribulation rapture. Hey, I write them back and say, don't say that because I said it. Say it because God says it. Give me, I say, give me the verses that, that prove that. I, I want you to believe it because God said it, not because Robert Breaker said it. And they usually do. They usually write about, well, you know what I meant. Yes, I believe the Bible proves, preaches and proves a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, quickly, quickly, Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw beasts rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now the dragon is Satan. So Satan gives power and authority to this man, the man of sin. Some people say it's Ergodon. It could be. It almost sounds like the word dragon in his name, Ergodon. Uh, from, is it Syria or wherever he's from, Turkey? But then in verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And verse 4, And they worshipped the beast, and on and on and on. So, here you go. That is the death of the man of sin. And that could be very easily when the son of perdition comes. And how long does the son of perdition rule? Verse 5, Power to give unto him to continue 42 months. So I see the Antichrist as a man ruling for 42 months or three and a half years first, right after the rapture. Because the rapture, when he's revealed, that's when the rapture takes place. He rules for three and a half years. And then the Antichrist is now Satan incarnate because this man of sin is assassinated. And then the devil rules for the last three and a half years. That's when he sets up his throne. That's when he takes over Israel. That's when he, and, and everyone says, who can make war with him? Well, what did he do? He must have defeated the Jews and took over their place. So with all that stated, whew, <laughs> lots to talk about. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. So this is what I see in the very middle of the tribulation is the deadly wound. So I believe and have always believed in a seven-year tribulation and a rapture before the tribulation, and that should explain why. Now, Revelation chapter 12, verse 13 through 16. In the tribulation period, the book of Revelation is dealing with what takes place in the tribulation. And it's talking about the saints. Well, the saints in the tribulation are not the same saints as today. Today, when we're saved by trusting the gospel, we are what the Bible calls saints. So there are church-age saints, but then there are tribulation saints. Tribulation saints are people that became saints a different way than we are today. They don't become saints the same way we do. And so I'm going to show you some, some verses on this and show you how salvation is in the tribulation period. But in Revelation chapter 12, verse 13 through 16, this is clearly speaking about Israel, not the church. There's no doubt what I'm going to read to you right now is to Israel, not to the church. The church leaves at the rapture. During the tribulation, it's all about Israel. God saving his people, Israel. Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. Therefore rejoice you heaven, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that his time is but a short time. Well, that sounds like 
the last three and a half years when the devil comes down and literally enters into a body of flesh. Verse 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Now, who is the woman that brought... Well, that's Revelation 12. That's the sign that if that's what it was, and it looks pretty much like that's what it was, September 23rd, 2017, in the heaven was the woman giving birth to a man-child. It says, when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she may fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a times from the face of a serpent. So whenever this Antichrist dies, and we haven't seen that yet, a lot of people say, so are you saying that we're in the tribulation now, Robert Breaker? No, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I, I don't know what that marked in the heavens. It could have marked uh, nine months before the beginning of the tribulation, which is what I think could be. Uh, it could mark a year before. I, I don't know what that marks. But uh, what I'm saying here is that when this devil comes, which looks like it's in the middle of the tribulation, he goes after that woman. That woman is Israel. And it says that the woman is able to flee into the wilderness for a time, a times, and a half a time. A time is one, times would be at least two, and then a half a time. Well, that would be three and a half. So for three and a half years, the woman, Israel, is protected from the Antichrist. And what does he try to do? Chapter, uh, verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth, who's the serpent? That old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Do you remember what I read in Daniel chapter 9? That at the end there will be a flood? <laughs> Here's the flood! And this flood takes place sometimes in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, in which the devil is trying to kill the Jews. Now, why would the devil go after the Jews if the church was there? See, the church isn't going to be there. So the only people that the devil can go after are the other people of God, Israel. Because the people of God, the church, has left the building. Amen? They have left the building. So verse 16, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches rapture first. Rapture takes place the moment that the son, man of sin is revealed. When that man of sin is revealed, then the tribulation begins. And the tribulation is all about God going back to and dealing with Israel. You've got to remember that. No reason for the church to be in the tribulation at all. Now some people say, yeah, but the Bible says you shall go through tribulation. Paul was writing to a church about them going through, in their day, tribulations. And they did. They suffered for Jesus. They went through tribulation. But that's not the tribulation. That's not the tribulation. So here's the question. With all that stated, how do people get saved in the tribulation? Okay, First the rapture, then the tribulation. Now the tribulation is for two people. The tribulation here is for two classes of people. There's going to be uh, Jews. That's going to be the first class. And then there's going to be Gentiles. And that's it. So the church is taken out. So all that's left in the world are lost Jews and lost Gentiles. And God says he's going to go to the Jews in order to save the Jews. As a matter of fact, and I'm running out of time here, so I don't have time to go to Romans chapter 11. But I would ask you to read Romans 11, because Romans 11 is all about how Paul says that he will go back to Israel and, will, and all of Israel will be saved. So God's not done with the nation of Israel. And yet, these same people that tell you... There's no pre-tribulation rapture. They make videos and they say, and there's no Jews. And yet the Bible says there's a rapture so that God can go back to dealing. They're, they're wrong twice. And yet they've gained a lot of people following them. And it's really sad. So God is going to go back to dealing with the Jews, which are Israel. And in that time period, the Jews will have to come to Jesus. How will they be saved in that time period? And what if a person's not a Jew? Can a person get saved in the tribulation who's a Gentile? Now, for years, I've heard preachers preach, well, if you miss the rapture, then that's it. You'll never get saved, and you'll go to hell. And too bad you can't get saved in the tribulation because the Holy Spirit's gone and can't convict you of your sin, and so you can't get saved. I don't see that. I, I see that there is a way for a Gentile to get saved in the tribulation. But it ain't easy. It ain't easy. You're going to have to do something to work, and you're going to have to have faith in Jesus. 
and so much faith in Jesus that you're willing to die as a martyr for Jesus, which, by the way, would be a work. So here we go. Let's look at the Jews first and how the Jews are saved. I'm going to write up here on the board, and I mean, i got ten minutes. Maybe we can get through this in ten minutes. I hate to go over an hour. A lot of people say, Brother Breaker, preach as long as you want. I want to, but I'm getting older. And if I preach over an hour, man, it wears me out because i got to do the same thing in Spanish. So I'm trying to keep them down to an hour or less. But I do what I can. Amen? I get excited, too. I want to keep going. I want to teach as much as I can. So here's what we got. Salvation in the tribulation is by... Salvation in the trib, I'll just have to abbreviate, is by, the first one here, whoa, is by number one, enduring to the end. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24, four. enduring to the end. Yeah, we might go a little long today because there's so much to see here. Jesus Christ talked to the Jews. Remember, when Jesus was here on the earth in his earthly ministry, Jesus said he came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus' ministry was a Jew to the Jews. And so they asked him about what's going to be the end of the world, what's going to happen, and Jesus was talking to his Jewish disciples about what the Jews will go through in the tribulation period. And so in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 through 20, look at what it says. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, the end of what? What is he talking about there? Endure to the end. The end of what? The end of the football game? The end of your second grade class? The end of the block? I mean, no. The context here is the tribulation. So he that endures to the end of the tribulation is going to be saved. That's the context, and I'm going to read that in context. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So that you've got to endure to the end. Well, that's not a doctrine of Paul. That's not a church-age salvation. That sounds like works, enduring to the end. But he that endureth the same, uh, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, what's the gospel of the kingdom? That's very different than the gospel of Paul. The gospel of the kingdom was what Jesus preached, that he's going to reign. So all throughout the seven years of the tribulation, the gospel preached is, Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon. How soon? Within seven years. Are you ready for Jesus appearing? Are you ready for Jesus? He's not here yet. The Antichrist is here. Don't follow the Antichrist. Endure to the end. Wait until Jesus really shows up. And so it says here, <clears throat> verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let him that which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. Now, some people try to take Matthew 24 and say that that's talking to the church about the rapture. <laughs> I, still, I still can't believe there are people that don't understand their Bible. So is Jesus Christ telling us in the church age today, when you see this happen, you Christians, why well, get a plane ticket and fly to Jerusalem and look at all the mountains in Jerusalem and just fly and just just go up into the mountain. No! This is to choose in the tribulation in the last 42 months what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to get the heck out of Dodge because the Antichrist is going to come, the son of perdition, and he's going to rule for 42 months. He's going to take over the temple. He's going to sit there and they're going to have to flee for their lives. And so he says here, into Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. 18. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Verse 19. And woe unto them that are with child and them that give suck in those days. Verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, not ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be saved, saved, shortened. Who are the elect? Clearly Israel. God is going to save Israel. And this is what starts the great tribulation. I was taught in Bible school, and I believe this, that the last 42 months, this time, the last 42 months, is called the great tribulation. So you have the tribulation, seven years, and then the last half of it is called the great tribulation. That's when it gets even worse. Because that's when they're fleeing from the Antichrist who tries to kill them with the flood. And the flood, of course, would be during this time period when the devil is sitting on his throne saying this, that, and the other thing. So here's Matthew chapter 24. 
future deliverance of Israel during the tribulation. I was going to read Romans 11, 25 through 27. Just don't have time, but look that up. Romans 11, 25 to 27. Paul even tells us that God will save Israel. When does that take place? Israel is going to be saved in these last 42 months so that when Jesus comes at Armageddon, he'll have his people, the Jews, that he can rule over. Now, during this tribulation period, how are the Jews saved? I wrote up here at the very beginning of this message that in the tribulation period, it's faith plus works. And I tell you, there are people out there that do not believe that. They hate that. They want to believe that salvation is the same in the entire Bible. But let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 14, and let me show you from the King James Bible that salvation in the tribulation period is by faith and works. And how this is not a peculiar teaching of Robert Breaker, this is Bible. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, is the tribulation period. I've read from verse, uh, oh, I think verse 12 all the way down to verse 16 already to show you the context. So Revelation 12, 17 says this. Um, I forgot to drive, or draw this up here. <laughs> Salvation in the tribulation is by, number one, enduring to the end. Number two, by fleeing Judea. I wrote that, or we read that already. You had to flee Judea if you wanted to be saved. Now, number three, it's by faith in Jesus and keeping commandments. Now we're back to a keeping of the commandments set up, just like they were under the law, which was works. So the tribulation gospel, or the way to be saved in the tribulation, is faith and works. Let me show you that. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, And the dragon was wrought with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So these are Jews that are keeping the Old Testament law and they're believing in Jesus. Faith and works in the tribulation. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Another verse. Here's the patience of the saints. Now who's are the, who are these saints? These are tribulation saints, not church saints. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Keeping commandments is works. Faith is believing. So these Jews that are saved in the tribulation, they believe in Jesus. What are they believing? They're now believing that Jesus is their Messiah. And they're going to have 144,000 come and tell them, you were wrong, Jesus is the Messiah. And then they're going to have the two witnesses. And all of Israel is going to realize, we were wrong! We killed our Messiah, just like Daniel said when he showed up. He showed up, and we killed him. Now we believe in Jesus! And in that tribulation period, the Jews will now believe in Jesus. They'll believe he was the Messiah, and they will think, but we're keeping the Old Testament law to show him that we're faithful to him until he comes. So in the tribulation, the gospel or the, or the way of salvation in the tribulation is faith and works. Now what about Gentiles? What if you're a Gentile... And you don't want to go to hell. And you don't want to follow the Antichrist. Well, then it's a little different for you. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. If you are a Gentile, and that is you missed the rapture, and you're not a Jew, but you don't want to get the mark of the beast, and you don't want to go to hell, then you're going to have to be a martyr for Jesus. You're going to have to die for Jesus by having your head cut off for Jesus Christ. Now, who's going to do that? I don't think there's going to be a lot of people that want to line up and have their head cut off. But you either do that, or you go to hell. It's up to you, if you miss the rapture. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, look what it says here. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Well, amen, they're trusting the blood. And by the word of their testimony, okay, they believed in the testimony of Jesus, and they loved not their lives unto the death. What did they do? They died. They died for Jesus. Now you say, well, what are you, what are you talking about? Why, why are they dying for Jesus? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Look what it says here. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, nor had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So here are people that had their heads chopped off because they said no 
I do not believe in you, Antichrist. I do not accept you, Mr. Antichrist. I will not follow you, Mr. Antichrist, because I believe in Jesus and you're not him. The Antichrist says, cut their head off. They won't take my mark. Just kill them. And that's how they got saved in the tribulation, by allowing the, the Antichrist to cut their head off. Again, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Actually, let me... Well, yeah, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Alright, here's where he dies. And it says here, verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying unto them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Verse 15, And he had power to give unto the image of the beast, and in the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. How are they killed? Their heads cut off. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And he continues there telling us about 666. So what is this? Well, let's go to chapter 14. But in the tribulation period, you must take the mark of the beast or die. Okay, so salvation in the tribulation, if you're a Gentile, is... I'm willing to die for Jesus. Chop my head off, please. <laughs> me first. Because I will not follow you, Antichrist. I want Jesus, and I want to be saved. And the only way to be saved is have your head cut off. Then your soul goes straight up to the throne because you took a stand for Jesus Christ. That's not salvation today. That's way different than how we're saved today in the church age. Way different. That's works. Sounds like to me that there are works involved. You have to be willing to do something or not do something not take the mark, and then be willing to allow yourself to be killed for your faith in Jesus. What happens to those that take the mark of the beast? Revelation 14, 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, ten, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture under the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 11, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So, if you choose to take the mark of the beast, when Jesus comes back in Armageddon, he puts you straight into hell. So the mark of the beast is a death sentence, and you're going to burn in hell if you take the mark of the beast. So what's the only alternative? Tell the beast, tell the Antichrist, I'd rather die than serve you. And he'd say, I can help you with that. Chop! and your head cut off, and now you're instantly saved by denying the mark of the beast. So, the last thing here is not taking the mark of the beast. So this is salvation in the tribulation. Does that sound like salvation today? Does that sound like how we're saved today before the rapture? Of course not! What does Paul say today? He says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Today we're saved by grace through faith without works. In the tribulation they're saved by faith and works. They must endure to the end. Why, well, that takes some effort. You know, you say, well, what if I can live without taking the mark of the beast? Well, you can try it if you want to. But the Bible says a third of the ocean will turn to blood, a third of the forest will burn down, you know, all these catastrophes taking place. Uh, the Bible tells us that people are going to just go, ah, I wish I was dead, and they'll crawl under the rocks and say, let the rocks fall on it. There's going to be people dying in war, there's going to be heads cut off, there's going to be natural disasters. How do you know you're going to make it to the end? I've had people tell me, well, I'm not a Christian, but I tell you, I, I do believe the Bible. And when the rapture takes place in the tribulation, I'm not going to take the mark of the beast, but I'm going to endure to the end. I have 25 years worth of food, and I have a little cabin in the woods, and I'm going to, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, and a third of the trees will burn up, and so your cabin's going to burn down on your head, and you're going to die and go to hell. <laughs> no, that's not the way it works. If you're in the tribulation you want to be saved, you better march straight into the office of the Antichrist and say, hey, by the way, I, I'm a Christian, and I'd like my head cut off, please. Because you're not going to make it out in the woods. You know, it's a chance. It's a chance you can take if you'd like. But that's not the way to be saved in the tribulation. 
So you got to endure the end. You got to flee Judea. You got to have your faith in Jesus and keep His commandments. That's faith and works. You got to be a martyr for Jesus. Allow them to cut off your head, and you got to not take the mark of the beast. Now it may be possible that you just might make it through the tribulation without taking the mark of the beast and be alive when Jesus comes. But boy, I tell you, that's going to be hard. Now I've had people say, but I don't believe seven years. I think it's easy to make it three and a half years. Well, the Bible says he that doesn't have the mark cannot buy or sell. I've yet to meet anybody that made it three and a half years without eating. <laughs> so do you see, you either take the mark or you don't. If you don't, if they catch you, they cut off your head. If they don't catch you, you die of starvation. Either way, you didn't endure to the end. So the best thing to do, as somebody told me one time, they said, well, Breaker, what if you're wrong and Christians do go through the tribulation? I said, well, the first thing I'll do is, is go down to the local uh, 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 Antichrist police station and say, yes, I'd like to have my head chopped, please. Please cut off my head, please. <laughs> because when they're going around giving the mark of the beast to everybody, I'm going to be the, the, the testimony that says, not this guy. Here you go. Put the head in the guillotine. Me first. I want to be a better testament, because if that would be salvation in the tribulation, then what are you waiting for? Get saved as quickly as possible, let them chop your head off. Thankfully, I don't have to go through the tribulation. Thankfully, I'm saved, and I know the rapture comes first. But I'm worried about you. What if I'm preaching to somebody that's not saved? Have you ever thought about how to be saved? The gospel is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-4. through 4. I ask you to read it. Salvation today is not of works. Salvation today is by trusting Jesus shed blood, the finished work of Christ, and then you're saved. But how about after the rapture? What if you miss the rapture? Well, this needs to be preached to you. You need to know. Uh-oh. I missed it. All right. I need to love Jesus enough to die for him. And when they start giving people the mark and saying those that don't take the mark will be have their heads cut off, you need to stand in line and say, excuse me, is this the line to chop off heads? Yes, I'm here to have my head cut off. Because that is how you're saved in the tribulation. That's the fastest way to be saved in the tribulation. And that is not the same as today. So again, many people say <laughs> this anti-biblical statement, people are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New. That's not true. In different dispensations, salvation is a little bit different. And I would be a horrible minister of the gospel if I didn't explain that to you. I want you to see what the Bible is. And the reason I mention that is I want you, and I want to stress you, please get saved before the rapture. Don't go into that time. Please get saved today. I hope you're saved. If you're not saved, please get saved. Uh, part of my desire in this message was to uh, help people uh, give this out to others that aren't safe. Send this link to other people. People you know that aren't safe, send this link out. and Say, this is how you get saved, my friend. I hope this is a blessing to you. I hope you learn a lot from it. And we'll see you next week. And God bless you.